<laughs> oh, okay. All right. Hello and welcome to November Steam Cafe. My name is Angela Mettler. I work in the president's office at South Dakota Mines. Uh, we've been doing Steam Cafe since April of 2018. And Steam Cafe is a partnership between South Dakota Mines, South Dakota Public Broadcasting, and Hay Camp Brewing. So we want to thank our partners for making this a continued success. Um, this happens on the third Tuesday of every month, provided that COVID restrictions don't keep us from doing it. But we also do have the capability to go completely virtual if we need to. So in the future, we may have to do that. We're hoping to do both in person and virtual like we have been for the last couple months. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Brandon Scott, who is a research assistant professor in the South Dakota Mines Department of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering. And his talk is entitled Movies from the Nano World. Thank you, Angela. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, hope to talk to you guys a bit about the work that we've done in the lab for the last several years, really. Uh, and hopefully you guys uh, enjoy it as much as we do. So a brief overview of the immune function as we deal with cells in the immune system. And we have two branches of, the, of immunity, what's known as innate immunity, and that consists of your skin, your mucous membranes, and cells of that, including uh, the, uh, neutrophils, mast cells, monocytes, uh, so all of these different uh, cells, and those branch into the adaptive immune system, which uh, comprises an antibody-mediated response. So the differences between these two are that the innate immunity is an immediate response. So in the picture down here on the bottom, if you were to say cut your leg, the first cells that respond to that would be cells from the innate immune system, and their job is to really just try and keep things calm and, and, and clear it as best as they can. So they will then, uh, uh, and so they recognize large classes. So it can be bacteria, viruses, or parasites, but they don't recognize a specific virus, they recognize viruses as a class. And this response is really the same each and every time. So anytime you uh, uh, get uh, some sort of infection, the innate immune response is going to be the same. There's no memory that is there where it's amplified. This is contrasted with uh, adaptive immunity, and this occurs later. Uh, and that's because the innate immune system first needs to present what they found to the adaptive immune system to mount a more specific response. And so these recognize a very specific antigen via antibodies typically. And so this would allow us uh, to recognize a single variant of influenza. An example might be H1N1, which was one of the swine flus or the Spanish flu, versus uh, H3N2, which is a different subtype of the influenza virus. This is one of the reasons why vaccines against flu don't work every time each season, because the uh, the vaccine that's generated is specific to one virus, and if a different virus is prevalent, then it's not going to protect against that virus that's there. What's important, though, is that that response is much stronger and, and more potent, and so we call that memory uh, for, for the adaptive immune system. So we will be, uh, I, I wanted to bring both of those up so everybody was aware of them, but we're gonna be dealing with innate immunity and really uh, one cell in innate immunity, and that is the macrophage. And they sit kind of in the center of these, uh, this Venn diagram, and they are professional phagocytes, so they are, are cells that uh, their job is to eat uh, other things, and they also are presenting cells. So they are what bridges uh, the innate immune system to the adaptive immune system. And so, I just want to show a brief movie here of a macrophage in action uh, and not really describe how we acquired this, but just to talk about what macrophages are. So uh, uh, the macrophage literally means the large eaters from, from Greek, uh, and they are really the sentinels of innate immunity. And so they reside in ne nearly every tissue in the body. They have different names depending on which uh, uh, tissue they're in, but they're all subclasses of macrophages, and they're constantly surveilling the environment for danger signals, foreign materials, debris, or dead and dying cells. 
Okay? And so they internalize fluids through what's known as cell drinking or macropinocytosis, so large uh, um, gulps of extracellular fluid, or they eat particles through cell eating, which we call phagocytosis. So those are the two main processes that I'll be talking about today. And our goal in the lab is really to understand the signaling pathways that control this function uh, with very high spatial and temporal resolution. Okay. And so this work really is, is a, a massively collaborative effort. And so it, it spans both at uh, the School of Mines and at SDSU. And I've, I've broken it down into the three big projects that we're working on. Uh, and macropinocytosis uh, that is done, uh, a student here at Mines, uh, Shane Quinn, and that's done in collaboration with the lab of Natalie Takes at SDSU. And so really, we're, we're trying to understand how these cells uh, uh, respond to different stimuli in terms of their ruffling response and internalization of that fluid. Um, and so, and really pushing the envelope in terms of the imaging to go and image more and more colors at one time. On the phagocytosis front, that's done in collaboration with Adam Hoppe at SDSU. Uh, and here at School of Mines, uh, newly minted Dr. Norma Sorry, sorry, sorry Dewey. Uh, she's been working on large cells and Joseph Lloyd uh, has been uh, doing phagocytosis of uh, small targets, uh, smaller targets. Okay, so we're really trying to quantify how the target size uh, and the mobility affects the cell's ability to eat the other targets uh, and how so-called self don't eat me signals modulate the, the phagocytic response. And lastly, it is really a cell material interaction. And that's done uh, with Grant Crawford at School of Mines as well. And looking at uh, cells, both macrophages and other cells that are involved in uh, textured uh, uh, implants and seeing how the cell material interaction can be used to make a better therapeutic uh, coating for implants. Okay, and so listed below are the three students who are, are mainly involved in this work and we have Shane on the left, Yosef in the middle, and Dewey on the right. Okay, so without, without these three, uh, I, I wouldn't really be able to be standing here talking about them. Uh, these three have done an amazing job uh, in the lab taking this data. So, how exactly are we going to uh, see a, a, an image how all of these things happen? And so really what we need to do is make ourselves glow somehow. And so a real world example of fluorescence, you can see here in this picture of neon lights. And so in there, uh, we use an electrical current to excite uh, neon for the orange ones and different uh, noble gases. Uh, to generate the different colors, but we can excite that molecule. And when it relaxes, uh, it can give off a, uh, a photon of light that's of a different color. And we call that uh, process of absorption and emission fluorescence. So how does that look in terms of what we actually want? We don't have tubes of neon that we're looking at. We deal with um, proteins that are naturally occurring in jellyfish. And so that was where they were first uh, discovered. Uh, and so jellyfish are fluorescent by themselves. And they, this molecule in the center here, uh, I'm not sure exactly. Ah, here we go. Okay, so this is uh, the green fluorescent protein. And so this uh, molecule will fold into this characteristic uh, beta barrel structure. So it looks like a barrel. And inside of that, there's a chromophore that matures and forms into a fluorescent molecule naturally by itself. So we don't have to add anything else to it. And what's really cool is we can then stick that into cells. So here an artist put in different color fluorescent proteins into bacteria and struck it on an auger plate and, and drew on it and allowed it to grow. And then you can see the fluorescence uh, into this nice art. Okay. And so we're lucky now that there's been decades, uh, probably two decades of work making fluorescent proteins that span visible spectrum into the near IR as well. And so we have a wide range of molecules that we can choose from that have different colors. And that's important because we can then mix and match the different colors in a cell and say, have 
four or five of these different molecules in one cell at a time. And since they're proteins, we can fuse them to something else. So it's as if I had a balloon that was tagged to me in one color and a balloon to one of you uh, 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 other people in the audience, and we could distinguish between the two of us and we could watch where they go. And that's really what we're trying to do when we make these fusions is watch the protein of interest that is not fluorescent, where it's going by watching where the fluorescent protein is going, okay? And so, unfortunately, we don't get to make this. Well, maybe fortunately, I'm not a very good artist. And so we don't make this in the lab. What we actually get to see is something more like this. So we use scientific cameras that are, use grayscale. And so nothing is actually ever colored, which is disappointing maybe, but we get to then have a little freedom on the back end and, and use some techniques to, to color it in a way that means something to us. So we can see if two different uh, ones are there at the same time, we can say use magenta and green, and green, and when those two combine, that becomes white in, in computer graphics. Okay, so we can use all of this information, sorry, uh, to uh, uh, yeah, track all of these things. Okay, so now that we have some fusions that we're going to make, there are a lot of different ways that we can look at them. And we're gonna talk about one method in particular, but I wanna introduce some of the other uh, optical microscopy choices that we might have. And so I, I have here, uh, let's see if we can play these guys here. So a, a traditional wide field microscope uh, this is uh, pretty much it, any standard uh, fluorescent microscope that you might use. This illuminates the sample through the entire volume, and then we use an objective lens to collect that emitted fluorescence uh, uh, most uh, intensely at the focal plane, but we also get a lot of out-of-focus fluorescence above and below the plane that we want to look at. And so the images that we get back are severely degraded. And this is most true in the axial direction or the Z direction, just given the way uh, uh, optics work. We can collect a very crisp image in XY, so on the plane we're looking at, but as we go through Z, uh, it's about three times worse, okay? And so we can't really, if we were to use a wide field microscope, we wouldn't be able to resolve much more than, yeah, there's a cell there, okay? There's not a whole lot that, that we can do. We can get a little bit better by rejecting uh, that out of focus fluorescence, physically rejecting it, and that's done in a confocal. Uh, the trade off here is we still illuminate everything, uh, we just throw 90% of the light away. So it's a very uh, uh, tough on our samples because we're dealing with living cells. And so if you go around and shine this laser at a very intensely at, at something, it's going to what we call photo bleach, and you won't be able to watch it anymore because you've destroyed it. So there are ways to get around that by taking advantage of uh, 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 changes in refraction. I won't get into this one. This is a way to look at a very at one plane uh, near an interf interface. That's really great for getting very high resolution, but we can't see in the cell. We can only see right at the at, at the surface of that cell. So really what's taken, taken off is what's called selective plane illumination. And that's where we use two objective lenses, one that we call an excitation objective, and that generates a sheet of light. The thickness of that sheet varies. Um, and then we use a second objective that's orthogonal to that to collect the fluorescence from there. And so if we then move our sample in through that sheet of light, we can collect a plane of illumination each time and then build up a volume from each of those 2D planes, okay? So this, so selective plane illu uh, illumination has really taken over uh, and, uh, and variants of that, including um, lattice light sheet microscopy, which is what we'll discuss today. Um, that's, that's really the, kind of the next generation of, of these microscopes, okay? So, what does the microscope look like at the School of Mines? Pause for comedic effect. Uh, <laughs> um, 
it doesn't look like a microscope that you typically would think it should look like. It really looks like this, where we have an enclosure because we're trying to deal with very, very dim samples. And so if we didn't have this enclosure, we're gonna get a bunch of light from the room and, or have to work in the dark, which is terrible. Um, and so we can do that. And so what it really looks like if we open it up is something that looks like this, where it still looks nothing like a microscope that any of you would typically have seen. Hi, sweetie. <laughs> so if we zoom in a little bit closer here, uh, what we basically have is an excitation pathway where we're, where we're uh, expanding our, our beam here instead of it being a Gaussian beam or, or what looks like the, a Bell distribution where it's most intensive in the center and, and kind of spreads out there. We can expand that using these cylindrical lenses to focus it in one axis. Okay, and so we can get then more along a stripe of illumination. Uh, we can then use a, a spatial light modulator, which is just a, a fancy way to say a, uh, a liquid crystal display like you would see in a TV. That's a way to modulate the light so we can get it to interfere with each other. Since light acts as both a particle and a wave, uh, if we use the wave nature of it, uh, we can get them to interfere either constructively where they amplify their signal or destructively if they're out of phase and that then it goes away, it goes to zero. And so we can use that to really restrict uh, our, our illumination into a very thin sheet. And so that's what all of this is trying to do is to generate a very thin sheet of light that's long enough that, that allows us to image our sample. And then the detection side is really simple. It's an objective lens and then a mirror and a, and a second lens to, to focus it on to our camera or a pair of cameras that we have that we can split based on color. Okay, so if we look a little closer, here's kind of the objective lenses that you could see here, and they are sitting at 90 degrees to one another. And then our, our sample sits in what we call the spatula. And if we zoom in a little closer, uh, this is our cover slip, which is about five uh, millimeters in, in diameter. Okay, so that's kind of the length scale that we're dealing with. Uh, so it, there's not a lot of room and all of this gets closed in. It's very, very close between those objectives. Uh, and where our sample sits. So this works really well for single cells that we're gonna be looking at, but if you had like a tissue or an animal, that's not going to work. It's going to, you don't have enough room to image that sort of thing. Okay, so uh, if we, let's see if this will go here. Okay, so what I have shown here is kind of a real-time playback speed of data that we collect. And this is what it looks like on coming off the microscope, except I've colored it after the fact to be uh, magenta shows one, uh, one channel and then green is a different channel. And so we slide our sample uh, horizontally through our light sheet that's stationary. And then we're able to collect the fluorescence at each of those planes. And we can then use this information to build up that volume. And so if I were to show all my movies at real, real time playback, I would, you would get to see about a third of one movie before this is over. So we speed it up quite a bit. And so uh, what we are going to do here, this is sped up, this will be sped up about 70 times. So each image, we have about one image every uh, uh, 10 or 11 seconds. And then we're playing it back at 10, 10 frames per second, okay? And so uh, a little bit of, of what sizes there are. So this right here is one of my hairs. And so I measured it to see what the diameter of it was and it's about 55 microns. Okay, so there it's shown as 0 0.055 millimeters, okay? This box here also corresponds to about 55 microns. So this size is about the size of my hair. And then as this movie plays, as this movie plays, uh, this is a, a macrophage eating another cell. So it's engaging in phagocytosis. So it's about to eat this uh, cell that we've labeled with an antibody to tell it to eat it. That red line that was there was about five microns. So the cell that it's about to eat is about one fifth or one tenth the size of the cell that's there. Okay, so just to give you some, uh, a little bit of length scales here. Okay, so we'll watch this 
go through all the way here, and we can see very quickly then the membrane of that cell come up and engulf that target. Okay, so even just watching this, right, we can, we can learn quite a bit about the morphology of the membrane that's there and, and the timing of how, how, this, how long it takes for it to eat. Um, and, and so we've applied this watch the movie mentality to really try and understand how all of these things work. Okay, and so if we take then the process, so I showed this movie initially, and this is uh, uh, watching the macrophage do constitutive macropinocytosis or just constant macropinocytosis. We can then uh, learn quite a bit. So there's going to be a lot going on through here. We can see these ruffles that are coming up and coming over. Uh, and so as we zo we'll zoom in and kind of look at one of these, each of these uh, as we go. So we can see this large sheet come up and over and then it forms a macropinosome here. And you can see some of the stuff that's being internalized. That's kind of just noise, but it looks like it's being internalized. Uh, a couple more macropinosomes, but wait, there's more. So this actually was two colors that we're looking at. And so we can see the membrane of that cell, some more of the structure that's going on. And then what I am showing here in this magenta into white is activity of uh, a protein called, uh, it's localization of a, a, a molecule, okay? And so this is a signaling lipid, so part of the plasma membrane that signals uh, for other things to stick to it is essentially how that works. And so areas that are white are areas that that molecule is more highly concentrated, and then it, as it goes to magenta, it's lower in concentration. But what we can see then is, uh, We'll want to watch this. This is this is a lot of fun. Okay, so we'll just watch this one go through. And what we're able to do then is quantify how much of that signaling protein is is there throughout the entire volume of the cell or the individual ruffles, and this allows us to learn quite a bit just by watching what's actually going on, and so. Through some other experiments, where we, we can now know really that this uh, protein called PI3K, it really primes these membranes. So there is a, a, the model for how macropinosomes typically formed is this cup that comes up out of the plasma membrane and meets at the top. These data don't look like that at all. Right? We, we never see the, these fingers coming up and out and meeting at the top. It's more uh, either a wave that's coming up and over and, and cresting back uh, in these really large ones, or in more concentrated areas, we see these sheets uh, of membrane coming up and crossing over with one another and forming macropinosomes that way. Okay, so, so by watching what's going on, we can try and understand uh, how that process is actually working. Okay. okay. Um, and so some other cool things we can do is stimulate the cells. So if we give it its growth factor, so this molecule is uh, soluble, so we can add it to the, to, the, uh, to the stage and the cell recognizes that molecule when it comes in contact with it. And we can see very quickly it changes uh, and, and clears the entire surface there and, and forms one large what we call circular dorsal ruffle. And so this acts as a way to amplify signal by concentrating it into a very small area. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we're really trying to understand. So that's kind of, a, you know, I, I tried to keep it as high level as I could. Uh, our our long-term goals really are to try and understand in this particular process, how those molecules are trapped in there. And so as you can see as it, as it closes in on itself that the white is really um, uh, contained within that constricting process. And so uh, there, we, we think there's what's known as a diffusional barrier. So it's, it's a, a, a physical barrier that's keeping those molecules inside. And so we're, we're trying to use this microscopy to understand how that process occurs and then really uh, this next one's the big one. So there are lots of other signaling lipids 
rather than just one. And so we wanna have a real complete picture of the five of those molecules that are present. How each, so if we have a different color for each one of those signals and image that all in the same cell, that's, that's kind of our next uh, step for this process and try and get a, a much clearer understanding of how each one of them play uh, and, and feed back on each other, okay? Um, and then sometimes what we can, what we get to do is really set the, set the record straight. Um, and so uh, by, by watching this, if we stimulate this cell with a, a, a different stimulus, in this case, uh, proteins from the outer surface of a bacteria. And so the cell recognizes that as a danger signal. Um, and it, it really causes the cell to make lots and lots of macropinosomes. But what we can see very clearly is the structure of how those macropinosomes are formed. They're formed in the same exact way that you would see without stimulation, which is contrary to some, some more recent reports. Um, but we think that this is really what's going on given that we have a very clear view of this process. Okay. Okay, so that concludes our tour of cell drinking. Okay, now uh, on to uh, a little bit about um, phagocytosis or, or cell eating. And we call this process antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis. Okay, so in this process, uh, we have a target cell that has an, uh, an antigen that this antibody recognizes. And so those, look, the, the Y shape here is an antibody. And so what we call the, the fab fragment binds to our target. And this constant region down here binds to receptors on the surface of our macrophages. Okay. And so this is a very potent way to tell the macrophage to internalize this target and kill it. Okay, and this, uh, one, one therapeutic, rituximab, is a, a monoclonal antibody. So it's an antibody that recognizes one target. And it is against um, a, a molecule that resides on the surface of B cells. And so these are, uh, uh, there are B cell lymphomas and leukemias, so different cancers of, the B, of, of B cells that um, it's found very heavily expressed on those cells. So that makes this a really good target because it's not found on the healthy cells, but it's found at very high levels on the cells we want to remove. And so the mechanism of action is really uh, causing cells, to uh, cells of the immune system to kill the cancer cells is really what that's doing. And one of the ways is macrophages will eat those cells through ADCP. Okay, so we can then try and understand this process really well and, uh, and, and try and figure out what makes a really good antibody to, to cause ADCP to happen. And are there ones that don't work well or what are, what are the things that, that could go wrong that, that we might want to have a better therapy for in the future? Okay, so kind of a, a little overview of the way that we would actually do these experiments in the lab. We would take uh, B cells, so the, those cancer cells that express CD20, we coat them with the antibody. And then we also fill, their, their, fill the cell with a dye so we can see where that cell is. And then we drop them on our macrophages that both express a fluorescent protein on their plasma membrane and uh, a signaling molecule. And so if we go back one step here, where we make a fusion to this molecule here called SIC, and that's an essential protein for this process. So if you don't have it, uh, phagocytosis cannot uh, proceed properly under most conditions, okay? And so it's, it, it also binds to the receptor that the antibody is bound to. And so this is a way to really track where active uh, receptors are. So, uh, so this results then in a four color experiment uh, that, that we're doing. And we typically will take all four colors uh, per volume in about 15 seconds. That's, that's kind of our range that we're going with. Okay. 
And so what this looks like then, we have this much larger target now. See, these are about 15 microns in diameter. Um, and we can uh, watch as that's internalized and another particle then falls on it uh, and the, the macrophage makes these extensions up around it and encapsulates it like that. And so what we're really trying to do is test uh, a hypothesis between the, the way the receptors uh, interact with, with, the, with the target, uh, either uh, as though it were a zipper, so new uh, antibody receptor clusters are formed as the phagosome uh, encompasses the target, or what's called the trigger mechanism where enough of them uh, bind and coalesce at the base that then just triggers the process to go and you don't need any new uh, receptors to bind. Okay, and so uh, we have some hypotheses about this and, and it really comes down to the fact that we're dealing with another living cell that we're trying to uh, in internalize and it has a, a, a skeleton of its own. We call it the cytoskeleton. And so that gives uh, structure to the cell, but it also makes our target uh, uh, molecule either mobile, so it can either move freely or it can be immobile and stuck in place. And so those have different uh, uh, functions, really. And so our, our hypothesis is that as the mobility of our target, as it's able to slide more freely, we should get higher signaling. And so we can use our, our, our sick uh, molecule. So we should have an increased recruitment of that molecule there um, and as the mobility of that target increases. Okay, so uh, we'll just show, so this is kind of uh, what it looks like in terms of you know, uh, it eating and then the antibody target. So we can watch the antibody as it is reorganized uh, on that cell. Uh, and then we can then watch these clusters. So as you see those bright spots occur, that's where the signaling is most intense there. So those correspond very tightly to where the antibody signal is. And so th that's, this is really what's known as a semi-mobile target. And so, kind of the three extremes. So where it's very immobile, it doesn't move at all. Semi-mobile, it can cluster a little bit. And highly mobile, it clusters very strongly. We see a corresponding increase. So from immobile to mobile, uh, we see a much stronger localization of that signaling molecule. So that tells us that we're on the right track here. As the uh, mobility increases, so does the signaling, okay? Um, Skip this guy here. I want to move on to uh, uh, another big area that we're looking at, and that is the role of more target motility. So the cell's ability to move and evade capture. And so here in blue, we have our, our target cell that we're trying to have our macrophage here eat but because it's able to swim around, it, it resists being eat, eaten, okay? And so this, in, in the traditional uh, uh, cells that we're dealing with is a very rare event. So occasionally we see cells that are unable, or that are able to move and therefore be not uh, evade capture. But if we look at, uh, use a different cell that we can control its motility, so typically those cells just kind of sit there as little, uh, little balls, but if we treat them uh, for, and differentiate them, they then become very highly mobile. And so they become uh, on the order of 10 times faster than they are here. And so now we have a very clear and clean experiment to have uh, no mobility or very high mobility. Okay. And so, to, to really make this work, this is kind of a representation of what the cell surface might look like. And so we have different proteins on that cell surface that are different heights and different amounts, and they also move at different rates on that surface, right? So each, in this little representation, each one of those is a different protein. And so what we do is some uh, biochemistry to add a functional group to here that our antibody recognizes. And one thing that occurs there is this reaction is 
general to all proteins. So we essentially coat the, every protein here with our reactive group that our antibody then sticks to. What that means is we have different heights, different mobilities uh, and in, in the plane. Uh, and so it's, it's much more diverse in, in uh, who we're labeling. Okay, but importantly, it works really quite well. So we can drop a cell on here and it gets gobbled up. And it takes a little time, but it, it finally gets eaten, okay? And so what's not eaten though, are these cells that we allow to crawl a lot. So we can then watch them uh, almost get eaten, but fight their way out, right? And so you see as it lands on there, it's, it's crawling away and, and doing its best. A little bit of it got pinched off and eaten, but the rest of the cell managed to escape, okay? And so these uh, experiments are, are really quite interesting for us because um, since we can watch where the antibody goes, we can see in this one here, right, it's that green is the antibody. And so it's very, very brightly labeled at the start of the movie. And by, as soon as it touches down here, the macrophage ends up stripping all that antibody off the surface. And you can't see where that uh, other cell is, but it's crawling away. It's the same view from down here. And so, our, our, our real question is why? Why does all of a sudden the cell moves and it now just is like, well, I'm gonna take all the antibody and just and get, take all of it off. That has some really bad implications if you're trying to have your cells be eaten, but you've now removed your target to eat them. Right? You've now camouflaged them from the immune response, okay? And so um, kind of another uh, example of this here, the cell initially is not moving very much, but as the macrophage is trying and trying and trying to eat it, it just manages to squirm away, right? And it's never internalized. And eventually, if you watch long enough, the, the macrophage no longer recognizes it. And the, the other, the green cell in that case, just crawls along on top of it as though nothing is trying to eat it anymore, okay? And so like I was saying uh, a little bit ago, all of the antibody that's on the surface of these cells gets cleared off and the macrophage internalizes it in a process we call trogocytosis. And so that's eat, clearing off all of that target. Again, at the end where they were blue and yellow, they're all then just blue. So the, the cell is still there and intact, but it's just not, it's not coated with our antibody anymore. Okay, so our, our question was, can we get these cells to be eaten? And it turns out the answer is yes, we can. If we disrupt their cytoskeleton, so if we take away their ability to move, our macrophage then has no problem eating them again. So it really comes down to the motility of the target cell has a major impact on the macrophage's ability to eat it. Some things in, in here that are a little problematic for, for the analysis is that we know, because this is the same treatment that we did to other cells previously, that this disruption of the actin cytoskeleton makes the, the antibody fully mobile. And so there, we're changing two variables, which isn't what we wanna do. We want them to not be able to move, but we want the antibodies to move the same as they were when the cell was able to move. And so we've, des uh, we've designed a few experiments and we're in the process of testing that now uh, using some different uh, drug cocktails that will basically fix the cell in place, not kill it, but it, it fixes it in place and the, the cytoskeleton remains intact, but it's just unable to move. And so that'll really allow us to address with very fine detail whether it's it truly is motility by taking away that mobility uh, question. Okay. And so I think with that, um, I I'll conclude here and just I'd like to turn to some acknowledgements. So for first for me, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the funding that I've received through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. And so I'm one of, uh, it's lucky enough to be one of their uh, imaging scientists. Um, and so that's what funds my position. So I really uh, want to thank them for, for that. Uh, so I'd like to thank everybody in, in the School of Mines uh, 
nanoscience and nano, nano engineering department, in particular, uh, Dr. Anderson, who is uh, the one who built the microscope that we use uh, and, and get to exploit every day. Uh, I'd like to really thank uh, Dr. Hoppy and Dr. Takes at SDSU um, for, for being very uh, awesome collaborators to, to have. Uh, and I'd like to thank, uh, again, uh, Dewey, Yosef, and Shane, uh, who the bulk of this work uh, they were the ones actually uh, doing boots on the ground, c collecting this data. Um, additional funding from the NSF, uh, the South Dakota Governor's Office, um, HHMI uh, for the license for the, the instrument, and uh, BioCenter, uh, which is additional funding sources. I'd like to thank all of you for your time and, and listen to me talk about something that I love. Uh, and so I'll take any questions that you guys have. So. Yes, please. In your uh, uh, illustrations there, uh, what kind of a cell was that that was eating the, the bad guy's cells? So, um, it, it, the initial uh, one that I had. Well, at, the, at the end there, uh, are those the cells throughout our body that, that have this uh, innate yep. Yes, yes. So all of these, uh, all of the cells that we were trying, that we we're uh, using to eat, those were all macrophages. So those are all part of the innate immune system uh, that, that we have. They're, they're, they come from a mouse. Uh, that's a model that we use to, to, to model uh, uh, immunity. Uh, but yes. Sure. Um, so in the case uh, where we were coding the cancer cells with the therapeutic antibody, those would come from yourself if you were unfortunate enough to have cancer and, and get a mutation in your B cells, which are typically there. And B cells uh, are, are cells that produce antibody. So those are also white blood cells. These are all in, uh, in the immune system. And so those uh, are naturally occurring and they are what generates antibodies uh, to, to drive the adaptive immune system. But if you get a mutation in those cells where they become cancerous, uh, then th you would potentially require a therapy like this, where you would coat those, you would add uh, the antibody to them, coat them and allow your cells to, to destroy them. That's really how that therapeutic works. Uh, one way, yes. Yep, that is that is definitely. And then the, that dynamic happens. How do you tell who? What are some of the elements of the cells that are going to shift all the bad ones or the bad ones just going to grow over time? Right. Yeah, that's a great question, and that's some of the things that we're trying to tease out a little bit. And so one of the things that happens. Uh, in some of these cases. So in, in the typical B cell population, uh, the, the first bit of cells that we were eating, almost 95% of those cells are eaten. So it's a very effective therapy, but there are cases where it doesn't work. And so it seems just by, by chance, we, we found some uh, examples where the target cell, right, so the cancer cell, had the ability to move and had a very dynamic cytoskeletons. And, and so that was really what led to that whole last part was that, that moment in the lab where like, oh, these cells are never eaten when they move. Is there something to that? And so it, it was really a chance you know, it's one out of, you know, five out of a hundred, right? Or that, that actually might be too high, uh, that, that, that number. And so we really tried to devise a way that we can make them either all completely immobile or all very mobile and really see, is that an important factor in what makes it uh, eat or not? And, and so some of the other things that we've done is look at different antibodies to different uh, proteins on the surface. And so those will have, uh, you know, different expression levels. So how many are there, how tall they are, uh, how fast they move in the surface. And so 
uh, those all played different roles in, in, in the efficacy of, of uh, phagocytosis. Does that answer your, your, your yeah. question? Please. How do you how do you stabilize your microscope so you don't have spurious separations? Yep. So so that large table is very heavy, and it's actually float. The the legs are floated uh, with air, um, and so. Uh, the, the table can can rock and stabilize itself that way, but you don't uh, initially. If you if you turned it off and I were to walk across the room like this, you would see my footsteps in in the scan. You would see vibrations. But by floating the table on air, then it, you you eliminate those vibrations. And then we have the around the objectives, we warm them. And so our our biggest enemy is actually thermal fluctuations. And so it might feel as though the room temperature is constant, but it's not, right? It's constantly fluctuating a little bit. And that causes what we call focal drift. And that's really the biggest thing is uh, as the temperature goes up and down a little bit, our focus goes up and down a little bit. Um, and so by stabilizing that temperature to a very, you know, a tenth of a degree, that allows us to then lock in the focus uh, really well. Any more? Yes, please. Yes. The first part of the presentation you talked about the different types of microscopes. Yeah. Now, on the the first type of microscope, what was that? That called. Let me just go back. So I'm on the same page as you here. This guy. Yeah, the focal plane microscope. What, what's the, 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 the depth of field of your focus relative to your sample? Right. So that really is going to depend on the magnification of our objective lens that we're dealing with. Um, and so in the typical kind of, uh, the, the, in this wide field case, we, we would typically say we're, we're diffraction limited. Okay, and in, in X, Y, and so that's the, uh, because light is, uh, again, acting as a wave, we can only focus it to a, a point uh, that's limited by diffraction. And so that's typically about 250 nanometers in X and Y. Um, but in, in Z, right, the axial resolution, which is really what matters, uh, that's about three times worse. So this is about 650 nanometers, uh, which is far too coarse to try and resolve things in Z. So all of these guys here, they're, they're drawn in different places, but those would all get summed into kind of one blurry image that we would see there. And so that's kind of really, but it, the depth of focus really depends on the objective lens that, that we're dealing with. Um, but yeah, for, for these guys, it's really everything that's in, uh, this entire volume here, which may be, you know, millimeters thick, much larger than the microns, or there's an order of magnitude, uh, all of that will be illuminated. And then we'll be uh, collecting fluorescence from all of that out of focus, but it'll be out of focus and look like blur. It won't be a crisp image. Any other questions for Dr. Scott? One more. <laughs> Just kidding. You can ask as many as you want. Yeah. How do you uh, induce uh, the voltage to get these, these cells to fluoresce? Ah, right. So I, I should have said that. So we, we use actually lasers. <laughs> uh, that, that's how we don't actually introduce a voltage. We use a light source. Uh, and, and so we, we have a bank of lasers that sit there uh, of different colors. And so each laser will be 405 nanometer, which is ultra, which is violet, uh, 488, which is greenish. Right? Uh, and so we can work our way through the, the visible spectrum uh, and use the energy that each of those photons of light carries to excite the electron that is in the fluorophore. Okay, so we use light to excite the fluorophore, and then those fluorophores emit light of a different color that we can collect. 
And that's, that's the way that we are, are uh, exciting and collecting the fluorescence from those. That's right. We, 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 yeah, in all of these, right, we're using a light microscope. So we're, we're, we're bringing in this detection in through here. This is depicting a laser beam really is what, what we're doing here. So we have a, a beam that's turned into the sheet of light. Uh, and in this, uh, in, in this case, the energy is confined to just this, this beam here. And so then the, the molecules will absorb light of a given color. That's that they have a characteristic spectrum that is maximal at one point. Uh, and, and that's really what we try and hit is that excitation maximum. And that's, that's where, um, that, that would be analogous to using uh, the, the correct voltage and, uh, uh, yeah. Um, I don't know, actually, I haven't, yeah, yeah, I have no idea. So I will <laughs> know what you know, I think is the right answer there. <laughs> It is what jellyfish do, though. I do know that. <laughs> Anything else? Any further questions? No, and I don't think we had any online. I was looking, so. Okay. All right. Again, I want to thank everybody for coming uh, and for joining us online, if you did that. Um, again, this is uh, every third Tuesday of the month, and uh, next month uh, is going to be presented by Dr. Darren Claybo, who is the South Dakota State Fire Meteorologist and a research scientist at South Dakota Mines, um, and he is going to be talking about incident meteorology, weather prediction in wildfire management, so we hope to see you in December. Thanks for coming. <laughs>